Pimp is the life story of the man known as Iceberg Slim. In this completely frank story, told without bitterness and with no pretense at moralizing, this is unlike any book ever published. No one before has dared to tell such a story. No one who hasn't lived as a pimp could possibly imagine the smells, the sounds, the fears, the petty triumphs, the world of the pimp. Of the pimps who don't die in prisons or in insane asylums or who aren't shot down in the street, none has ever written his life story before. But Iceberg Slim miraculously managed to shake the dope habit and to free himself from the life he lived and breathed for over 20 years. And he now has given us the truth about the life of a pimp. Iceberg Slim started out in life with two strikes against him. He was poverty stricken in a world where money determines a man's worth and he was a negro in a white society. But in his favor, he was young, he was handsome, and he had a superior IQ. He was too ambitious and had too much determination to accept his inferior status. There were only two avenues open to him, crime or pimping. Either choice was disastrous. He chose pimping as the lesser of two evils. A way of gaining an income and some degree of status without totally destroying all his sense of humanity or losing his own self-respect entirely. Finally, after 20 years of life in hell, he managed to escape through the love of a woman and to make it in the square world. No other book comes anywhere near this one in its description of the raw, brutal, reality of the jungle which lurks beneath the surface of every city. Hey folks, welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph your master of ceremonies. I would like to take this moment to tell you folks thank you for joining me on Ralph Reads. And please tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe. 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 Don't forget to comment and share as well to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, I will continue this no-holds-barred approach to storytelling from the pen of Iceberg Slim, as I bring to you the second installment to his biographical tale, Pimp, The Story of My Life. I am currently reading the Holloway House version, the first printing of this novel, copyrighted, published, and distributed in 1967. A tale, 100 years in the making. Let's not wait any further. Let the reading commence. Chapter 3. Salty Trip with Pepper First thing back in Milwaukee, I reported to my parole officer, a Mr. Rand, I think. After asking a thousand questions and filling out a mountain of papers, he gave me an IQ test. When he computed my score, his sea-blue eyes saucered in surprise. He couldn't understand how a boy with a score of 175 could do a stupid thing like peddling a girl's ass on the sidewalk. If that IQ test had been on the basis of the half-baked criminal pimping theories that I had picked up in a joint at that table from those chili pimps that were churning in my mind and that I was so eager to try, my score would have been zero. I was 18 now, 6 feet 2 inches tall, slender, sweet, and stupid. My maroon eyes were deeply set, dreamy. 
My shoulders were broad and my waist as narrow as a girl's. I was going to be a heartbreaker, all right. All I needed was the threads and a whore. Mama's small, lucrative beauty shop was on the main drag. Poor Mama. She was doomed, I guess, to inadvertently set up my disasters. I had started on my job delivering for the drugstore owned by the friend of my mama's who had hired me to satisfy the parole condition of a job upon release. As fate would have it, mama's shop and the drugstore were in the same building. Mama and I lived in an apartment over the storefronts. Mama called me in from the sidewalk one day about three months after I got in parole. She wanted me to meet one of her customers who was getting her eyebrows arched. I walked through the pungent odors of rising from the hot pressing combs, pulling through the kinky hair of several customers to the rear of the shop. There she was, flashy as a Christmas tree, sitting before a mirror at a dressing table with her back to me. Mama stopped plucking at her brows as she introduced us. Mrs. Ibbets, this is my son Bobby. Like a yellow cat hypnotizing a bird, she sat there motionless, her green eyes smoky as she stared at me through the mirror. Then the velvet purring voice undulated toward me. She said, Oh, Bobby, I have heard so much about you. It's so exciting to meet you, but please call me Peppa. Everyone does. I don't know what excited me more as I stood there. Her raw sensuality or the blazing rocks on her tapered fingers that I was sure hadn't come from Kresge's. I mumbled something like I had to go back to the drugstore to work and I would see her around. Later, I saw her slide into her sleek caddy convertible, her white silk dress riding up exposing the satin sheen of her banana yellow thighs. As she gunned away from the curb, she turned deliberately and gave me a full dose of those hot green eyes. She was signing our deal. I quizzed around and got the background on her. She was 25, an ex-whore who had worked the jazziest houses on the eastern seaboard. A wealthy white fence and gambler had tricked with her out there, and it had gotten so good to him that he crossed her pimp into a five-year bit and squared her up. Three days later, a half an hour before closing, an order came in for a case of mums. The address was in the plush heights, miles from the store. I made a trip on a bicycle. She answered the door wearing only a pair of white lace step-ins. My erection was hard and instant. It was a fabulous pad, and the lights were soft and blue. The old man wouldn't be back for a week. I was just a hep punk. I wasn't in her league, but one of my greatest assets has always been my open mind. That freak bitch cajoled and persuaded me to do everything in the sexual book and a number of things not even listed. What a thrill for a dog like her to turn out a tender fool like me. She was a hell of a teacher, all right, and what a performer. If Pepper had lived in the old biblical city of Sodom, the citizens would have stoned her to death. She nibbled and sucked hundreds of tingling bruises on every square inch of my body. Fairest change, as the old saw goes, is never robbery. It took me a week to get the stench of her piss out of my hair. She sure had been pimped on hard back east. She hated men, and she was taking her revenge on me. She had taught me to snort girl, and almost always when I came to her pad, there would be thin sparkling rolls of crystal cocaine on the glass top of the cocktail table. We would snort it through alabaster horns, and then in the mirrored bedroom, we made circus love until our nerve ends shrieked. Pepper and that pure cocaine would have made a freak out of the priest. She had sure put me on a fast track. I couldn't know at the time that at the end of the line stood the grim state penitentiary. 
I was green, all right, and twice as soft, and Pepper knew it. Here was a hardened ex-whore who knew all the crosses, all the answers, who handled lots of scratch, and wasn't laying a red penny on me. The dazzling edge on our orgies was dulling for me, but I was flipping Pepper with the techniques she had taught me. I knew all the buttons to push for her, and she burned hotter than ever for her little puppy. No wonder. I was freaking for free. Those eastern pimps had charged her a fortune. I tried one night to get a C note from her for a suit. I knew I had really come on fine in the bed. She had almost climbed the walls in her passion. Sugar, I said. I saw a wild vine for a bill downtown. If you laid the scratch on me, I could cop tomorrow. She slitted her green eyes and laughed in my face and said, Now listen, little puppy. I don't give men money. I take it from them. And besides, as sweet as you are to this pussy, you don't need a suit. I like you as you are, with no clothes at all. I was a rank greenhorn, sure, but her cold turndown of my plea for the C-note was bitchy cute. And I was a salty sucker, so I reacted like any stupid would-be pimp who had been Georgied. I had fouled up basic business. I had led with my dick instead of my mitt. I reached down and slapped her hard against the side of her face. It sounded like a pistol shot. On impact, a thrill shot through me. I should have slugged her with a baseball bat. The bitch uncoiled from that bed like a striking yellow cobra, hooked her arms around my waist, and sank her razor-sharp teeth into my navel. The shock paralyzed me. I fell on my back across the bed moaning in pain. I could feel blood rolling from the wound down toward my crotch, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. Pepper was sure a strange twisted broad. She was breathing hard now, but not in rage. The violence, the blood, had turned her on. She was gently caressing me as she licked with a feathery tongue the oozing wound on my belly. She had never been so tenderly efficient as she took me on a beautiful trip around the universe. The funny thing was that throbbing awful pain somehow became a part of, melted into the joy of the feathery tongue, the thrill of the thing that Pepper was doing to me. I guess Freud was right. If it thrills you to give pain, you can get your jollies taking it. When I left Pepper, I was sapped. I felt like an old man. My mood was as bleak and cheerless as the gray dawn I cycled through. When I got home and looked into the mirror, a death's head stared back at me. That vampire bitch was sucking my life's blood, all right. I also knew that crystal cocaine wasn't exactly a health tonic. Pepper was too fast, too slick for me. I had to make her shit or get off the pot. I made the skeleton in the mirror a solemn vow that before the week was out, I would in some way get Weeping Shorty, a pimp about 55 who, while a gorilla pimp, was the best pimp in town to pull my coat to give me a plan for putting a ring in Pepper's nose. Before I got busted, I had seen him at Jimmy's joint. He had looked horrible then. And now, less than a year and a half later, he looked like a breathing corpse. Hoss was his boss. He had chippied around and gotten hooked. It was Friday, almost midnight, when I found him. He looked at me and made that clacking sound against the roof of his mouth with his tongue. You know, that mischievous, weirdly joyful sound that a young kid makes the instant before he rams a hat pin into your eardrum. Then he said, Well, kiss my dead mammy's ass if it ain't Mackin Youngblood, the horse pet, and the pimp's fret. The junkie bastard was jeffing on me, lashing me with contempt and scorn. 
Old pimps always know when a youngster with a yen for the pimp game is desperate for advice. After all, they remember when they started and what a bitch it was just to learn the million questions. The answers would come slowly from heartbreaking trial and error from the ass kissing of the few who had solved the riddle who pimped by the book. The cleverest pimp could give a thousand years and never come close to all the answers. Weeping Shorty was an old man, and he had gotten past the questions and had worked out a few answers, but even so, he knew a thousand times more than I did. So, I fought for control. I couldn't show anger. If I did, he would cut me loose. We had been standing under the awning of a vacant storefront. He pulled me with a jerk of his head. I followed him to a big shabby Buick. It was parked at an intersection in the Cheap Trick District. When we got inside the Buick, I understood why he had parked it there. He could watch and keep tabs on a stable of scrawny junkie whores working the four corners of the intersection. He sat under the wheel not saying anything, his eyes straight ahead. I had kissed his ass for a half an hour and now he was freezing up. I thought of the tiny pile of cocaine wrapped in tinfoil under my instep that I had flinched from Pepper. I fished it out and held it in my hand. Perhaps the cocaine would open them up. I turned to him and said, Weeping, do you want a light snort of girl? He stiffened like a butcher knife had been run into his back. He looked at the wad of tinfoil in my palm and snatched it and in the same motion hurled it through the window on his side. His top was blown. He shouted, Nigga, ain't you got no sense? You trying to go back to the joint and blow my wheels? I said, What did I do wrong? All I did was offer the C just to be sociable. What's wrong with that? He said, Sucker, first booty butt, you don't transport no hard in your stomp. Keep it in your mitt so you can down it fast to the turf. Second, you're on parole. You're hot. You ain't got no business sitting dirty in my short. There's a law, sucker, that can confiscate a short with stuff in it. You know if the heat had hit on you, you would unload in my short. Keep stuff off you. When you stop somewhere, down it in the street until you ready to split. It's better to get beat for the stash than beat by the heat. Now what took your head out of Pepper's ass long enough for you to look me up? Oh, how this junkie creep bugged me. I sat there beside him trying to think of questions that would bleed him so I could get out of his face fast. He looked exactly like a withered baboon. His breath stunk like he had just eaten a bowl of maggots. I said, weeping, Pepper hasn't got my nose open for her. She's too jazzy and slick for me. I came to you because everybody knows that your game is mellow. I want you to pull my coat so I can pimp some scratch out of her. The baboon liked that banana I threw at him. He was ready to talk the pimp game. He said, the suckers in hell want ice water, but it's late for them. They ain't never gonna get no ice water. The way you start with a bitch is the way you end with a bitch. You can start pimping hard on the bitch and then suck her out and blow her, but ain't no way you can turn it around and pimp on Pepper after starting with her like a sucker. Forget her and get down on a fresh bitch. I said, you mean there is no way to get any scratch out of her? He said, now you see, I didn't say that. I said, you, a foxy, cold-blooded stud, can always find an angle to cross abroad out of scratch. I said, I'm not foxy, but I think I could be cold enough to cross that slick bitch pepper. Weeping, you are the fox. Lay some game on me and put me to the test. I'll split any scratch I take off right down the middle with you. I hadn't noticed it was raining. Now it was raining hard enough so that Weeping had turned to run up the window on his side. He had just raised it and was about to answer my proposition when there was a frantic rapping on his window. 
It was one of his whores. Through the closed window of the locked door, she said loudly, Daddy, open the door. My feet are soaked. Nothing is happening out here tonight. And besides, I am hot as hell. The vice is watching me. It's Costello. He told me to get off the street, or he would bust me. Please, open the door. Weeping was a cold gorilla, all right. He sat there for a long moment. His monkey face was tight and hard. He casually opened the wind wing as the rain beat down on his whore. She struck her nose through it. Without moving toward the wing, sitting erect in the car seat, he hollered, You bullshit bitch! Make something happen! You're a whore! You're supposed to be hot! Let Costello bust you! He can't make a beef stand up unless he catches you with a trick, you dumb chicken-hearted bitch! What do you think I got this ass pocket full of fall scratch for? Now get out there and work! Don't worry about the rain! Walk between the raindrops, bitch! He slammed the wing shut. Her face was wild and angry through the murky glass. Her dope-rotted teeth were ragged fangs in the dimness as she pressed her face close to the glass. She screamed, You just lost a girl! You had four! Now you got three! I'm cutting you loose, shorty! Weeping, let his window down and stuck his head out into the rain as she walked away. He was all gorilla now. He screamed, Bitch! I give you odds you won't split! As much of my dope you've been shooting, I'm playing catch up! You rank bitch! You know if you split, I'll find you and stick my knife into your sticking ass and gut you to your breastbone! I wondered if he lost her. He read my mind. He said, She ain't going nowhere! Look at this! He turned his car engine on and started the windshield wiper so we could see the street. There she was, back out there in the rain, whistling and waving at the passing cars. He switched the engine off. He said, That bitch knows I ain't driving! She'll make me some scratch this morning. Now, young blood, about Peppa, you don't know anything about her. You ain't long out of the joint. I like you. So my advice is the same I gave you at first. Forget her. Try in another spot. What he said about my not knowing her made me curious. I said, look, weeping, I know you like me. And if you do, run Pepper down for me. Did you know that Peckerwood of Peppers is the bankroll behind the biggest policy wheel in town? No, but if the old man is flush, isn't that good? Why give Pepper up because she's in shape? If you gave me an angle, I could get some of that policy scratch. Look, blood, brace yourself. Here in the rest of the rundown, Pepper is a rotten freak broad. You ain't the only stud she freaks off with. I could name a half dozen who ride her. The dangerous one is Delansky, the detective. He is in a bad way over Pepper. If he ever found out you were freaking off of her, blood, shame on your ass. I was shaken by the rundown. Like a sucker, I believed that I was the whole show in her love life. I was thinking like the young punk I was. I said, are you sure there are that many studs laying her? He said, maybe more. I had a bellyache and a worse headache. I felt lousy. I mumbled, thanks for the advice and the rundown, weeping. I got out of the Buick and walked home in the rain. When I got there, it was 3.30 and Mama was angry, worried, and raving. She was right, of course. I was violating my parole to be out after 11 p.m. I was coming out of the drugstore to make a delivery when I bumped into him on the sidewalk. It was old party time! While doing his year for our caper, he had copped a lonely heart's broad through the mails. She went his train fare. He finished a bit and went to visit her and made a home. She had died and the home went to relatives who threw him out. 
After five bits, he was still full of crooked inspiration. I liked him, but not enough to join him again in the hustle. I had only been out four and a half months. I cooled it and avoided him in a smooth way. I hadn't touched Pepper in a week. She had called the drugstore twice just before closing. She had made licking and sucking sounds to get me out to her place. I made excuses and put her off. I wondered at the same time why I was so important when she was a douchebag for that mob that was laying it into her. The day before weeping brought me a proposition, Delansky, the roller, came into the drugstore for cigarettes and gave me a thoughtful look. I was walking home. It was my day off. It was Saturday night around 9. I had been to see a prison movie. It was a grim drama. A young green punk tried a double cross. He was crisscrossed into the joint. He made deadly enemies while doing his long bit. When he got out, a long black short pulled up and riddled him with a Tommy gun. A big black car was pulling to the curb toward me. There was something familiar about that small pinhead driver. It was weeping. He jerked his head and opened the car door. I went over and got in. He was excited. At first, I thought because his car was clean. He told me, Blood, put a smile on your face. Old Shorty's got good news for you. How would you like a half a G in your slide? I said, All right, give me the poison and take me to the baby. He said, I ain't shuckin', it's cream puff work. In fact, tender dick, it's what you like to do best. Want the rundown? If you're gonna tell me some broad is going to lay out 500 frog skins to get a rocks off, say it. I will lay a syphilis patient that died a week ago for that kind of scratch. Then he said, Pepper is the broad. All you have to do is take her to bed and go through a full circus with her, that's all. Are you game? Yes, if I get a rake off from the bleacher seats, I said, and you tell me who wants to show on. His eyebrows jitterbugged. He was a slick joker. I should have run from him. He said, no, I can't tell you who. Don't worry about the scratch. It's guaranteed. Are you in? I said, yes, but I want to know more. Like why? The tale he told me went like this. A fast hustler from New York who specialized in pressure rackets saw a chance to trim Pepper's old man out of a bundle. The hustler knew that Pepper was a dog and a freak. He also knew that Pepper's old man was hung up on her. Even though he had met her in the whorehouse and squared her up, he was dangerously jealous of her and unpredictable if he caught her wrong. The hustler felt that Pepper would be in a sweet state for pressure if solid evidence could be gotten showing Pepper as the dog she was. The hustler was sure he could force her to help him in his scheme to trim the old man. He needed clear, unfaked photographs. His plan would be simple. Once he got the club over Pepper's head, he would force her to sneak in phony hit slips against the policy wheel. The hustler had discovered that for Pepper, from her inside position in the wheel, it would be very simple. The hustler would pay me five bills after I had brought Pepper to a prearranged setup. I was all for the scratch and eager to give Pepper some grief for the way she had used me and outslicked me. Weeping told me the trap was set. I was to wait until Pepper itched enough to call me. I was not to call her. Whenever she called, I was to tell her to meet me in the bathroom of an old but still elegant hotel on the fringe of the arcade and shooting gallery section of town. I was then to call him. I was to make sure that at least two hours passed between her call and when I went to the desk and asked for the key to apartment 214. My name would be Boxdale. That name I'll never forget if I live to get a hundred. On the third day, after I had gotten the rundown on the trap, Pepper called the store. 
It was 8.55 p.m., five minutes before closing. I answered the phone. She was burning blisters for one of our parties. She invited me to her place as usual. I told her that I had to tidy up the store and also mail an important package at the downtown post office for my boss. I asked her if she could get dressed and meet me by 10.30 in the ballroom of the hotel. It would be more convenient that way, she agreed. I called weeping. He told me to maneuver Pepper's face toward the head of the bed as much as possible when we got into the act. I went to the bar room and drank rum and coke until she got there. I almost felt sorry for her when I saw her coming through the door. She looked so innocent and clean, not at all like the cruddy filly that humped up a funky lather beneath a mob of jockeys. We took a booth so I could watch the clock. She was Jacqueline the Ripper with a fly, but she had a great gentle touch inside, if you know what I mean. She was a space buff, all right. She was checking out my readiness for entry into inner space. At 11 sharp, Mr. and Mrs. Barksdale picked up the key to their pad. We walked onto the stage. Wyatt Earp would have gone ape over the pad. It was overstuffed horsehair living room. Gleaming brass bed, giant cherubs on the wall, Gideon Bible on the marble top bedroom table, midget efficiency kitchen cubicle. So what? We hadn't come to cook. High in the wall over the bed were the two gold colored cherubs. Their eyes were holes, their mouths popped while holding the light fixtures. When we got into the brass bed, we got the show on the road. I was almost sure some steamed-up joker in the adjoining room had his gizmo focused on the carnival through a drilled hole peeking from a shrub's empty eye socket. Pepper let me out of her hog at 1.30 in the a.m., just two blocks from Weeping's horse stand. I felt good. I was going to collect five fat ones for my pleasant night's work. It was like having a license to steal. I spotted Weeping's pinhead in his Buick. As I walked toward him, I couldn't stop thinking about that eastern blackmailer. I thought about that green rain that would fall when Pepper started rolling those phony hits in. I thought about how I could catch a few palms full. Smooth as silk, the payoff came off. When Weeping handed me my scratch, he gave me a funny look. He said, Take it easy, blood! Take it easy! The next day I went downtown and got clean. It was the early years for the Nat King Cole trio. They were playing for a two-buck dance that night at Liberty Hall. Party and I were in the balcony at a table overlooking the crowded dance floor. We were slaving like sand hogs, trying to tunnel into the flashy high yellows on our laps. They were almost stoned, ready for the killing floor. Party saw him first coming in the front door of the auditorium. He knifed me in the side with his elbow. Then, con style from the side of his mouth, he whispered, The Lansky, the heat. The bastard's head was on a swivel. He was looking everywhere at once. I felt mad butterflies with fingers ricocheting in my belly when his eyes spotted me and locked on me. I froze. His eyes were still riveted to me as he walked up the stairway straight for me. I pretended to ignore him. He walked up behind me and stood there for a long moment. Then he dropped a hand like an anvil on my shoulder. He said, Get up! I want to talk to you. My legs were shuddery as I stood in a small alcove with him. He said, Where were you around ten after last night? Relief and courage flooded me. That was easy. I hedged. Why? He said, Look, punk, don't get cute. Where were you? Don't answer. I know where you were. You were out on Crystal Road in the nighttime burglarizing the home of Mr. and Mrs. Frank Ibbets. Nighttime burglary is five to ten. My courage and relief swiftly drained out. 
Frank Ibbets was Pepper's old man. He was roughly frisking me now. He ran his hands into my side pockets. With one hand, he brought out the $300 left from my payoff plus 20 clean dollars. The other came out with a strange brass door key. He said, Jeez, for a flunky in a drugstore, you got a hell of a bankroll. Where did you get it? And where and what does this key fit? I said, Officer, that's crap game money. I've never seen that key before. He grabbed me firmly like he had captured Sutton and walked me through the dancers out the door to his short. He took me down and booked me on suspicion of grand theft burglary. He also booked the scratch and key as evidence. Mama came down bright and early the next morning. She was in a near fainting dither. She was clutching her chest over her heart. She said, Bobby, you're going to kill your mama. You haven't been out six months, and now you are back in trouble. What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? You need prayer. Get down on your knees and pray to the good Lord. I said, I don't need to pray, mama. Believe me, there's nothing to worry about. I didn't steal anything from Pepper's house. I am not nuts. Pepper will tell them the truth. Mama, I was with her. I got my first nightmare inkling of the corkscrew crisscross when Mama broke into tears. She rolled her eyes to heaven. She blubbered. Bobby, there's no hope for you. You're going to spend your young life in prisons. Don't you know, son? Your Mama loves you. You don't have to lie to me. I went out to see her early this morning, she said. She told me she hasn't seen you in a week. Mr. Delansky had bought Pepper's spare key down there. That key in your pocket was one you stole when you made a delivery out there. Finally, she went down the corridor. Her shoulders were jerking and her sobbing. It was an iron cross. My public defender went to that hotel to get corroboration for my alibi. The joint had been too crowded, too hectic. None of the employees remembered Pepper and me. At least they said they didn't. The desk man on that night had been a substitute and wasn't now available. My signature wasn't on the register anyway. I went into court again with the dirty end of the stick. I was a parolee arrested at 1 a.m. with a bottle of whiskey in front of me in a public place. Pepper looked like a prospect for a convent. She had stripped herself of paint and gigaws. She testified that the key found in my slide was hers, and that yes, it was possible that I had stolen it while making deliveries to her home. No, she had not seen me for a week before my arrest. My defender had gotten a change of venue. I was afraid to go before the judge who had sent me to the reformatory. I got two years in state prison for grand theft. The amount, $500. My parole was to run concurrently with the new sentence. Pepper's old man was with her in court. They bought the cross. I couldn't figure who had sold it to them. Was Delansky the joker that Weeping worked for? Or had Delansky heard that I had a wad and without knowing anything about the hotel affair, sold it to Pepper? For what reason had the old man bought it? Had those hotel employees been bribed or threatened? If Delansky was the brain, did he want me out of the way for a reason other than Pepper? Maybe someday I'll find out what really happened. I know if I had had lots of scratch, Miss Justice would have smiled on me. She favors the bird with the scratch. The Wapun State Prison was tough, but in a different way than the reformatory. Here, the cons were older. Many of them were murderers serving life sentences. These cons would never put up with the kind of petty tyranny that was practiced in the reformatory. Here, the food was much better. There were industries here. A con could learn a trade if he wanted to. He could go into the yard during recreation hours and learn other trades and skills. 
Here, the desperate heist men congregated to plot new, more sensational robberies. The fruits and punks lay on the grass, in the sun, romancing each other. This was a prison of cliques, of bloody vendettas. I found my level with the soft-spoken, smooth Midwestern pimps and stuff players. Since I was one of the younger cons in the joint, I bunked in the dormitory. It was like a suite in the Waldorf compared to the bug-infested tight cells in the reformatory with their odious crap buckets. It was there in that dormitory that I got the insatiable desire to pimp. I was a member of a clique that talked about nothing except whores and pimping. I began to feel a new slickness and hardness. I worked in the laundry. I kept my clothing fresh and neat. It was in the laundry that I met the first man from whom I got cunning to balance my hardness. He was an old drag man with his bit getting short. He was the first to attempt to teach me to control my emotions. He would say, Always remember whether you be the sucker or hustler in the world out there. You've got that vital edge if you can ironclad your feelings. I picture the human mind as a movie screen. If you're a dopey sucker, you'll just sit and watch all kinds of mind wrecking. Damn fool movies on that screen. He said, Son, there's no reason except a stupid one for anybody to project on that screen anything that will worry him or dull that vital edge. After all, we are the absolute bosses of that whole theater and show in our minds. We even write the script. So always write positive, dynamic scripts and show only the best movies for you on that screen, whether you're a pimp or priest. His rundown of his screen theory saved my sanity many years later. He was a twisted, wise man, and one day when he wasn't looking, a movie flashed on the screen. The title was Death for an Old Con. He died in his sleep behind the high gray walls. His fate was that which lives like a specter with all cons. The fear of dying in a cell. I sure miss that convict philosopher. The wisdom he taught me took me successfully through my bit. I was released after 21 months. I got three months good time for good conduct. With good time, I was free, hard, slick, and bitter. No more small towns for me. I was going to the city to get my degree in pimping. The Pepper Cross had answered a perplexing question for me. Why did justice really always wear a blindfold? I knew now it was because the cunning bitch had dollar signs for eyeballs. Chapter 4 A Degree in Pimping When I got back to Milwaukee, Mama and the streets, my mind was straight-jacketed into the pimp game. Back in the joint, I had dreamed almost nightly. They were cruel players. They were fantastic. I would see myself gigantic and powerful like God Almighty. My clothes would glow. My underwear would be rainbow-hued, silk petting my skin. My suits were spun gold, shot through with precious stones. My shoes would be dazzling silver. The toes were as sharp as daggers. Beautiful whores with piteous eyes groveled at my feet. Through the dream mist, I would see huge shaped stakes. The whores' painted faces would be wild in fear. They would wail and beg me not to murder them on those sharp steel stakes. I would laugh madly. Springs of scarlet would spurt from their behinds as I joyfully booted them crotch first onto the sharp pikes. They would flop around like dying chickens. They would finally fall away in a welter of blood into two red halves. 
When I awoke, my ticker would be earthquaking inside me. The hot volley of the savage thrill lay sticky wet between my trembling thighs. I had other terrible dreams. I will be very tiny. A gargantuan Christ in a sea of light will be towering above me. In his anger, his eyes will be blazing blue suns. His silky platinum hair would stand on edge in his rage. A shaft of purest white light would shoot from the top of his index finger. He would point toward a woman. Her back would be turned to me. He would hand me a barbed leather whip. Like a crash of summer thunder, he would command, Punish this evil woman. Destroy the devil inside her. The Lord's soul directs thee. Eagerly, I would grab the heavy whip in both hands. I would bring it down with all my force on the woman's back. She would just stand there. The scarlet would drain down from her slashed back. She would be standing to her knees in the river of blood. She would turn her brown, agonized face toward me. It would be Mama. I would be shaking and screaming in my sweat. It was horrible. I could never cut the dream off until its end. I had to run its fearful course. The dreams about Mama came until her death. For a day or two following them, these dreams would recreate in daydreams. Sudden dark arrows of depression and regret would stab into that open sore in my mind. I would get high. The narcotics seemed to ward off like armor the stealthy arrows. After a week of rest and mama's soul food, my color and strength came back. On a Saturday night, I decked myself out in one of the vines and top coat I had bought the day before Delansky busted me. I remember the pimp rundowns at the joint. I had learned my first step had to be a fast cop. I needed a whore to hit the city scene. I had to get on that fast track to pimping. I was only several months away from age 20. My baby face was gone. I was six feet two. I was as thin as a greyhound on a crash diet. I went into an underworld bar, the 7-Eleven Club crowded with pimps, whores, and thieves. I stood at the far end of the bar, stalling with a coke. I faced the front door. I turned and asked a slightly familiar elephant beside me about weeping and party. He turned his head. His dime-sized eyes got stuck in my fly zipper as he looked me over head to toe. He remembered me. He said, about a month ago, your Boon Coon party caught 60 in the county. One of them tight pussies opened his nose wide enough to drive a freight train through. He caught a stud, whamming it into her. The stud quit the scene. The broad had to go to a croaker to get party shoe out of her ass. Then, after pausing to thumbnail a ball of snot from his trunk, he said... Old Weeping fell dead outside a shooting gallery in St. Paul. Must have shot some pure, cause a lookout on the sidewalk heard him mumble before he croaked. Well, kiss my dead mammy's ass if this ain't the best smack I ever shot. The elephant again raised his hoof toward his filthy trunk. The sissy barkeep sat at a fresh bottle of coke on the log before me. I yanked my eyebrows into a question mark. He lisped. The runty black bitch in the middle of the bar sent you a taste. Without taking my eyes off his thin yellow face, I said, Sugar, run her down to me. Is the bitch qualified? Is she a whore? Does she have a man? The corners of his mouth seesawed. He slugged this soggy, dirty bar rag against my reflection on the bar top. He almost whispered, The bitch ain't nothing but a young skunk from St. Louis. She ain't nothing but a jazzy jive whore. I'm more whore than she is. 
She ain't got no man. She's a cum freak. She's Georgie 3 bullshit pimp since she got here a month ago. If your game is strong, you could play a hog out of her ass. She ain't but 18. I eased the bone from my pocket, put it on the bar for the fresh coke. I frantically remembered those pimp rundowns in the joint. I said, tell the bitch no dice. I'll take care of the little things, and if she's qualified, maybe I'll let her take care of the big things. Give the bitch a drink on me. On the jukebox, Ella Fitzgerald was crying about her little yellow basket. The barkeep twinkle toed toward her with the wire and drink. Through the blue mirror, I zeroed my eyes in on the target. My ass bones starched on stiff point. Her big peepers were two sexy dancers in the velvet midnight of her cute Pekingese face. Hot scratch fever streaked through me. I thought if I could cop her and get a pimp's terms, she would be out of pocket, poison to all white tricks that pinned her. Those pimps back in the joint sure knew basic horology. I was glad my ears had flapped to all those rundowns. They had said, Chase a whore, you get a chump's weak cop. Stalk a whore, you get a pimp's strong cop. My turn down of her measly first offer had her jumpy. It was a slick, sharp hook twisting in the bitch's mind. Her juicy tongue darted out like a red lizard past her ivory teeth. It slithered over the full lips. She wiggled toward me in an uneven race with the barkeep. He was sliding her green drink between me and the elephant. I heard a low, excited trumpeting in the trunk of the elephant. He had dug her flawless props and gourmet rear end. It was rolling inside her glove-tight white dress. I painted a lukewarm and different grin on my face as she perched on the stool. I noticed a roll of scratch wedged deep between the black peaks. She said, Who the hell are you? And what is that off-the-wall shit you cracked on the bartender? My eyes were sub-zero spotlights on her face. I said, Bitch, my name is Blood. And my wire wasn't off the wall. It was real, like me. Bitch, you sure got a filthy, sassy job. It could get your ass ruptured. The big vein at the temple in the tiny dog face quivered. Her rapper was shrill. She bleated, I ain't no bitch. I'm a motherfucking lady. The stud ain't been pulled out of his mammy's womb that kicks my ass, God damn it! Call me Phyllis. Be a gentleman and respect me. I'm a lady. The icy blast busted the thermostat in my spotlights. I could feel my cool spit on my lips as I roared, You stinking black bitch! You are a fake! There's no such thing as a lady in our world. You either got to be a bitch or a faggot and drag. Now, bitch, which is it? Bitch, I am not a gentleman. I'm a pimp. I'll kick your funky ass. You gave me first lick. Bitch, you're creaming to eat me up. I'm not a cum freak. You are. I'm a freak to scratch. My blast had moved her. Those joint rundowns sure worked. I could see those sexy dancers were hot as hell there in the midnight. She was trying to conceal from me the freakish pain-loving bitch inside her. She was comical like that fire and brimstone preacher. He was trying to hide his heart on from the cute sister in the front pew flashing her cat for him. The broad was speechless. I had called all the shots. I turned toward the crapper.
As I walked away, I bombed her. I said, Bitch, I'm splitting. When I come out that crapper, I know your pussy is jumping for me. I know you want me for your man. Some lucky bitch is going to steal me from you. You better toss that bullshit out of your mind. Get straight, bitch, and tell me like it is on my way out. You had your chance. After tonight, you don't have any. Inside the crapper, I ripped a wad of paper from its holder. I wrapped the saw buck and the four singles around it. Whatever happened out there, I had to show a bankroll. I stood there in the crapper. I was letting the heat seep deep into that bitch out there. Was I going to cop my first whore? My crotch was fluttery at the thought of it. I walked out of the crapper. She was outside the door. I almost trampled her. I ignored her. I walked to the bar to pay my light tab. She was peering over my shoulder. I peeled the saw buck off. I told the barkeep, steal the change and cop a hog. His bedroom gray eye sparkled. His delicate pinky scooted the saw buck back to me across the log. He said, sweetie, it's on me. Come back at two and cop a real girl. She tugged at my sleeve as I turned from the bar. She looked up at me. Those dancers had stripped. I looked down at the hot runt and said, Well, bitch, it's your move. Do I cut you loose? She grabbed my shoulder. She pulled me down toward her. I could feel her hot breath on the side of my head. She popped that lizard tongue into my ear, almost to my eardrum. It sent hot shivers through me. I stayed cool. I turned my head and knifed my teeth into the side of her neck. I don't know why she didn't bleed. She just moaned. Then she whispered, You cold-blooded sweet motherfucker, I go for you. Let's go to my pad and rap. We walked to the slammer. I glanced back. The elephant was staring at us. His tongue was frenching his chops. His trunk was twitching for a party. On the sidewalk, she handed me the key to her yellow 36 Ford. I was lucky. I had been taught to drive the laundry truck back in the joint. The Ford's motor sang a fine tune. It wasn't a pimp's wheels, but it sure would make the trip to the city track. I drove to her pad. On the way, she played on me. She was setting me up for the Georgia. That lizard thought my ear was a speedway. It did a hundred laps inside it. I was still green. I shouldn't have let her touch me. Her pad was a trap for suckers, all right. She had pasted luminous white stars on the hotel room's blue ceiling. There was one blue light. It glowed sexily from behind a three-foot plaster copy of Rodin's The Kiss. There was a mirror over the bed. There were mirrors on the walls flanking the bed. There was a polar bear rug gleaming whitely in front of a blue chaise lounge. I sat on the lounge. She flipped on the portable record player. Ellington rippled out Mood Indigo. She slipped into a cell-sized bathroom. Its door was half shut. The peak was digging a washcloth into her armpits and cat. She was nude. She sure was panting to swindle me out of my youth. I wondered if and where she had stashed that roll of scratch. She came out belly dancing to the indigo sex booster. She was a runt Watusi princess. Her curvy black body had the sheen of seal skin. I had one bitch of a time remembering the dialogue that covered this kind of a situation. What had the pimps in the joint said? You gotta back up from them fabulous pussies. You gotta make like you don't have a swipe. You gotta keep your mind on the scratch. Stay cold and brutal. Cop your scratch first. Don't let them Georgia you. 
they'll laugh at you. They'll cut you loose like a trick after they flim-flammed you. Your scratch cop is the only way to put a hook in their stinking asses. She danced towards the head of the bed. She stooped over and raised the edge of the red carpet. Her rear end swayed to the indigo. It was grinning at me. It was theater in the round for sure. She danced toward me. She had two thin reefers in her hand. That box at the side of the bed had rejected and indigo was encoring. She stood between my legs. Even though the trouser cloth, I could feel the hot dampness of her outer thighs. The inner surface of my kneecaps wrinkled under the heat. She quivered and rolled her jet satin belly under my nose. Her humming of the indigo was low and throaty. She sure qualified as the package the pimps had warned about. My 21-month cherry was aching to chunk out. She took a lighter off the cocktail table. She ran the sticks in and out of her mouth to get an even burn. She lit them and handed me one. She said, Daddy, this is light green pot from Chili Gut Country. It will make us mellow. Why don't you take your clothes off? I took a deep pull on the stick of reefer. I looked up into the sultry, dreamy eyes. I parroted, Bitch, don't put shit in the game. Business always comes before pleasure in my book. I'll take my clothes off when I know I'm taking them off with my whore. I don't sucker for the Georgia. Jar loose from respectable scratch, bitch. I had heard it verbatim in the joint. It worked like a lie detector. The motor in her belly threw a rod. Her eyes had a far away look. She was busy tailoring the con for me. She collapsed to a yogi squat on the polar bear rug. Her moon was winking at me. Her voice was bullshit sweet. She warbled. Sweetheart daddy, you already shot me down. I'm your sweet bitch. I got a C-note coming from a trick with his nose open for me. He'll spring for it tomorrow night. It's yours, but you gotta wait. Now come on and put your freak baby to bed. My system had been clean. The reefer was powerful. She didn't know how desperately I needed to pimp. She couldn't know she was the first. I couldn't let her escape. I had to have a whore. That reefer was sending currents of anger through me in time with Indigo. My mortal enemy squatted on that white rug. I thought, I am going to murder this runt black bitch. If she don't give me that scratch she had in her bosom. Like a brute cop giving a heist man a last chance to confess, I said, Bitch, give me that scratch you had between your titties. Her peepers ballooned in surprise and anger. She gritted, you pimpin' too hard, skinny-ass nigga. I had changed my mind. Get your lid and Benny and split. The indigo was on a torrid upbeat. Like brown-skinned lightning, I leapt erect from the chaise. I flung my right leg back. I could feel the tendons at my hip socket streaming. My eyes sighted for a heart shot. My needle-toed 11 AAA shoe rocketed toward her. The lucky runt turned a fraction of a second in time. The leather bomb exploded into her left shoulder blade. It knocked her flat on her belly. She lay there groaning. Then, like in the dreams in the joint, I kicked her rear end until my leg cramped. Through it all, she just moaned and sobbed. I was soaked in sweat. Panting, I lay on the bare skin beside her. I thrust my mouth against her ear. In an icy whisper, I said, Bitch, do 
I have to kill you to make you my whore? Get up and give me that scratch. She turned her head and looked into my eyes. There was no anger in him now, only fear and strange passion. Her tremulous mouth opened to speak. For a long moment, nothing came out. Then she whispered, You got a whore, blood. Please don't kick me anymore. I'm your little dog. I'll do anything you say. I love you, pretty daddy. Her talon stabbed into the back of my neck as she tried to suck my tongue from its roots. I could taste her salty tears. She wobbled to the record player. She lifted a corner of it. She slid that wad of scratch from beneath it. She rejected indigo. She put another platter on the turntable. Lady Day was singing a sad lament. My man don't love me. Treats me awful mean. He's the meanest man that I ever seen. I was standing on the bare skin. She came toward me with the scratch in her hand. She laid it in my palm. I riffled it in a fast count. It was respectable. It had to be over two bills. I was ready to let that cherry pop. I scooped the 90-pound runt up into my arms. I bit her hard on the tip of her chin. I carried her to the side of the bed. I hurled her onto it. She bounced and lay there on her back. She was breathing hard. Her legs were a wide pyramid. I got out of my clothes fast. I snatched the top sheet off. I ripped it into four narrow strips. I tied her hands to the bedposts. I spread eagle her legs. With the longer strips, I tied her legs to the top of the springs at the sides of the bed. She lay there a prisoner. I put her through the nerve-shredding routines Pepper had taught me. She blacked out four times. She couldn't pull back from the thrilling, awful torture. Finally, I took a straight ride home. On the way, I tried to smash the track. I reached my destination. The blast of hate was big enough to spawn a million embryo black pimps. I untied her. We lay there in the dim blueness. The fake white stars glowed down on us. Lady Day still moaned her troubles. I said, Bitch, I want you to hump like hell in the streets for a week. We're going to the big track in the city. Oh yes, this week we got to get that title to the four changed. I don't drive no bitch's wheels. It's got to be in my name. Understand? She said, Yes, Daddy, anything you say. Daddy, don't get angry, but I was bullshitting about that scene no trick. I said, bitch, I knew that. Don't ever try to con me again. I got up and put my clothes on. I peeled the fin off the scratch and put it on the dresser. I said, I want you in the street at six tonight. Stay out of the bars. Work the area around 7th and Apple. I'll come through sometime tonight. You be there when I show. If you get busted, your name is Mary Jones. If you forget it, I can't raise you fast. Have some scratch whenever I show. I went down to the street. I got into my Ford. It roared to life. I drove toward Mama's. I felt good. I wasn't doing bad for a black boy just out of the joint. I shuddered when I thought, what if I hadn't kept my ears flapping back there in the joint? I would be a boot black or porter for the rest of my life in the high-walled white world. My black whore was a cinch to get piles of white scratch from that forbidden white world. Mama was pressing a young customer's hair. She saw me get out of the Ford in front of the shop. She called me inside with a waggle of the pressing comb. She said, I have been worried. Where have you been all night? Where did you get that pretty little car? Did you find a job? I said, a friend of mine let me borrow it. 
Maybe he'll sell it to me. I stayed with him all night. He's got a hundred and three fever. I'll try to find a job tomorrow. She said, There's a roast in the oven. Shut the gas off and eat. I hope, son, you haven't been with Pepper. I looked down at the nut brown, shapely girl getting her hair pressed. I said, Pepper? She's too old for me. I like pretty young brown skinned girls. Pepper's too yellow for me. The young broad flashed her eyes up at me. She smiled. I winked and ran my tongue over my lips. She dug it. She blushed. I put her on file. I turned and walked to the sidewalk. I went upstairs and attacked the roast. I took a long nap. At 5.30 p.m., I went down and got into the Ford. I drove to 7th and Apple. I parked. At five minutes to six, I saw Phyllis coming toward me. She was a block away. I fired the engine and pulled away. It sure looked like I had copped a whore. I went back at midnight. She looked mussed up and tired. She got into the car. I said, well, how goes it, baby? She dug in her bosom and handed me a damp wad of bills. I counted it. It was a fin over half a sea. She said, I'm tired and nasty, and my shoulder and ass ache. Can I stop now, Daddy? I would like a pastrami and coffee and a bath. You know how you kicked me last night. I said, bitch, the track closes at two. I'll take you to the sandwich and coffee. The bath will have to wait until the two o'clock breakdown. You needed your ass kicked. She sighed and said, All right, Daddy. Anything you say. I drove her to an open-air kosher joint. She kept squirming on the hard wooden bench. Her butt must have been giving her fits. She was silent until she finished the sandwich and coffee. Then she said, Daddy, please don't misunderstand me. I like a little slapping around before my man does it to me. Please don't be as cruel as you were last night. You might kill me. I said, baby, never horse around with my scratch or try to play con on me. You blew my stack last night. You don't have to worry so long as you never violate my rules. I will never hurt you more than to turn you on. I drove her back to the track. She got out of the car. As soon as she hit the sidewalk, two white tricks almost had a wreck pulling to the curb for her. She was a black money tree, all right. The next day, I took her to a notary. In ten minutes, we walked out. She gave me the three bills back that I had paid her for the Ford. It was legal now. She wasn't beefing. Her bruises were healing, and she was ripe for another prisoner of love scene. She finished the week in great humping style. I had a seven-bill bankroll. Sunday evening, I packed the runt's bearskin and other things into the trunk of the Ford. I parked around the corner from Mama's. I went up to get my things together. Mama caught me packing. Tears flooded her eyes. She grabbed me and held me tightly against her. Her sobbing was strangling her. She sobbed. Son, don't you love your mama anymore? Where are you going? Why do you want to leave the nice home I fixed for you? I just know if you leave, I'll never see you again. We don't have anybody but each other. Please don't leave me. Don't break my heart, son. I heard her words. I was too far gone for her grief to register. I kept thinking about that freak black money tree in the Ford. I was eager to get that fast pimp track in the city. I said, Mama, you know I love you. I got a fine clerk's job in the men's store in the city. Everybody in this town knows I'm an ex-con. I have to leave. I love you for making a home for me. You have been an angel to stick by me through those prison bits. You'll see me again. I'll be back to visit you. Honest, Mama, I will. I had to wrestle out of her arms. I picked up my bags and hit the stairs. When I reached the sidewalk, I looked up at the front window. 
Mama was gnawing her knuckles and crying her heart out. My shirt's front was wet with her tears. We have reached the ending of this portion of the Iceberg Slim miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like, or rather love, to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook. Send a friend request to Ralph Anthony Garcia on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to rgmc2407 at gmail.com, where if you'd like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash rgmc2407 or cash app. My cash tag is rgmc2407. You may also connect with me on my music channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, and right here on this channel, T-U-R-N, the United United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks for the continuation of this Iceberg Slim miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Be good to yourself and others.